Hi, hello, and welcome back to Skeptics and Seekers. I'm uh, one of your hosts, Dale, representing the Christian or Seeker side. Hi, and I'm the other guy, David, the Skeptic. All right, and we have uh, a special episode for you guys today. Uh, we have a special guest, uh, Craig Keener. Welcome to the show, Craig. Great, great to be with you. Excellent. And uh, what, what we're going to be doing this week is we're going to be talking about the historicity of Acts. Um, so uh, just before we get into that, um, maybe give us sort of a, a brief introduction as to who you are there, Craig, and um, you know your faith journey to Christ and, and sort of your background in terms of Acts of the Apostles and that sort of thing. Sure. Um, I was an atheist, although... Uh, probably some of your some of your audience has better reasons for being atheist than I was. My my reason for atheist was, I guess, I was following the crowd of atheists. Uh, I wasn't really thinking that that clearly for myself. I, I mean, I had ideas. Like I thought, uh, you know, you could you could explain uh, the universe without recourse to the hypothesis of a god. Uh, but that, of course, didn't pr- disprove. I should have been an agnostic where I was. But anyway. Um, I, I won't go into all those details, but uh, but I also thought you know Christians were pretty stupid because most of the ones I met, I mean, it didn't seem like they were really taking their faith seriously. And I thought if there is a God, I would give God everything. So when I when I did become a Christian, I, I, and I did, um, I, I had an encounter with with God. That's a, a long story, but. Um, well, as a result of that, if I if I could just cut in, uh, sure. give a, give a brief sketch of it. Our audience, um, we've got uh, both atheists and Christians in the audience, and they they love a good uh, <laughs> conversion or encounter story. So we'd uh, love to hear yours. I don't think I I don't think I've encountered that in my research of you. So I'd I'd definitely like to hear it. Sure, um, I was, you know, I started wondering what if I'm wrong, <laughs> and also. At the time, I was reading Plato, or I'd been reading Plato, and Plato got me thinking about the things that I hadn't been thinking about. You know, like I was thinking about the universe in terms of, you know, just uh, stars and planets and galaxies. I wasn't thinking about my own existence as a sentient, conscious being. And, you know, you can explain it on a materialistic level, but I, I I wasn't dealing with like questions of whether there could be life after death or things like that. And so reading Plato got me really thinking about that and also was reading things about infinity in mathematics and so starting to think more about eternity and thinking, boy, you know, Plato's arguments are not satisfactory. But his questions are actually important. And so that got me thinking that unless there's somebody infinite that could validate um, or perpetuate my own existence, which was clearly finite and therefore clearly mortal, I was I was uh, doomed, <laughs> so to speak. And so I started saying, if there's anybody out there, God or gods or goddesses or whoever, please uh, show me. And, you know, I studied different religions, I studied different philosophies. But one day, some fundamentalist Baptists stopped me on the street. And I argued with them for about 45 minutes. And they were explaining to me from the Bible how I could be made right with with God. And I was like, you guys, I don't actually believe in God. So I don't actually believe in the Bible. Do you have anything else to, to tell me? And actually, it was kind of, uh, well, I, I laugh at it now, but <laughs> I I said, um, look, if there's a God, where did the dinosaur bones come from? Which is really a question that's rather irrelevant, but I didn't think so at the time. So if there's a God, where did the dinosaur bones come from? They said the devil put them there. <laughs> now, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was like, okay, you guys, I'll see you later. And I walked off. So they weren't trained in paleontology, obviously, but I was, uh, I, I had an encounter with, with the God of the message about Jesus that they proclaimed to me, so that, I mean, discussing different religions, reading about different religions, 
none of that had affected me before. But as I was, I mean, not ex apart from intellectually, I mean, I would consider the things. But as I walked home, I was having just this overwhelming sense of the presence of God himself. And when I got to to my room, uh, I was, you know, going back and forth. And just the presence was so intense and so demanding it you know it's not something that you can appeal to as objective evidence that would persuade somebody else but in terms of subjectively existentially there was no way i could i could sidestep it i had to either accept or, or reject and finally i said okay god okay i'll believe you I don't understand what Jesus dying and rising has to do with this, but if that's what you say, I, I believe you. But I don't even know how that makes me right with you. So if you if you want to do that, you're going to have to do it for me yourself. And all of a sudden, I felt something rushing through my body, like a, I mean, and I'm not saying this is normal or you know this happens to everybody. Um, from my conversations with people, it doesn't usually happen with people. But I was just overwhelmed with this sense of God's presence that there was no way that I could, I could, yeah, well, I decided, okay, I don't know what just happened to me, but uh, I always said if I ever find out that there's a God, I'll, I'll, I'll give God everything, so I guess that's what I better do, and uh, that was the beginning of my Christian life. Of course, I had plenty of intellectual questions, including, uh, they really had not solved my questions about paleontology i can guarantee that but <laughs> mm -hmm. and and then and then when i start reading the bible I'm, I'm reading it from the standpoint because i read a lot of greek and roman literature before beforehand so i get to this one passage in acts 14 and i'm thinking oh this sounds like ovid's metamorphosis and, and I'm, uh, eventually i get back to genesis and i'm thinking oh genesis 6 sounds like deucalion and pyra the greek myth of course, the ancient Near Eastern version was earlier than the Greek version, but um, I just knew the Greek version. So anyway, it's a it's a long story. But uh, eventually, I initially I had to I had a lot of catching up to do because I I was far more familiar with ancient Greek and Roman and even Egyptian religion than I was with with you know monotheism or so I started. Uh, Eventually, I got to the place I would read 40 chapters of the Bible a day for a while until I thought I could catch up with <laughs> with everybody else who'd been a Christian for a while. Um, and ev eventually, I, you know, I went on in that subject and did my PhD at Duke. Uh, and yeah, but but I, I love I love still to bring in the classical context of the you know when I'm reading the Bible. To read it in the context of the the historical setting to which it was addressed. So, I love to deal with the well, especially with the New Testament, which is 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 what my PhD is in. I love to to deal with the Greek and, and Roman background, and of course the ancient Jewish background, which uh, what was something I did have to learn more after I became a believer, because again that was something I had neglected. Gotcha. And and what was your uh, what sort of got you involved um, with Acts in particular? Because um, I know obviously you got your your massive four volume uh, commentary there. So yeah, maybe just sort of give us a, an insight into what got you interested in in studying Acts. Well, uh, I was interested in the whole <laughs> the whole thing, um, but as I was collecting background material, uh, I just. I ended up with a lot of it on Acts, and Acts is a very uh, moving narrative. It's much more uh, reader-friendly and positive than, <laughs> uh, I mean, Mark, you know, the, the climax of Mark is the crucifixion. It's not, it's not as uh, upbeat <laughs> as, say, Luke Acts is. Uh, you know, Luke Acts could have ended on, you know, Paul getting killed. You know, but he stops before that. He stops on a positive note. So um, it's it's fun to read, and I had a lot of material for it. I also wrote a two-volume commentary on John, and I'm, I'm doing a commentary on Mark for the ICC series. Uh, I've done commentaries on 
uh, Galatians and First and Second Corinthians for Cambridge, and we'll be doing uh, an Acts commentary, uh, shorter Acts commentary for Cambridge. So, uh, and and I have commentaries in Matthew with Erdman's and IVP. So, uh, and, and a commentary on Revelation with Zondervan. But yeah, Acts is more my. Uh, I just really got into <coughs> Acts, <laughs> but I I, I I never dare do that again. That one took me about ten years and. Human longevity being what it is, I, I need to uh, leave time for other projects. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, let's let's get straight into it. I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Oh, David, did you have something to say there? Or? Yeah. Well, I was just going to add uh, a thing to, to the next question. So um, you mentioned that you were initially introduced to the conversation about faith with a, a fairly fundamentalist Baptist. Yeah. What are, what are you now? Um, re- religiously, theologically, are you still a Baptist? Are you conservative, more <laughs> progressive? You know, how, w- I am, I'm, I'm a mixture. Um, I, I, <coughs> now, I didn't end up becoming Baptist at that point. I ended up joining a Pentecostal church, assemblies of God church. Mm-hmm. And then, um, I, I, well, of course, Duke's Divinity School is Methodist. The first place where I taught was um, Amy Zion, which is a an African American Methodist denomination. Then I taught at an American Baptist school, which is very different than the Fundamentalist Baptists. And then I taught, well, now I teach at Asbury, which is like half Methodist. Um, and I was, I was ordained eventually in a black Baptist church, which again is very different from the, from pretty much, you know, most of the white Baptist churches. And right now I, uh, we attend a vineyard church because our son is on the worship team there and we wanted to encourage him and we like it. So I'm kind of a mixture. I tell people I'm a Methodopticostal, but I mean, it, it's even more of a mixture than that. I mean, I was with Anglican scholars in November at Lambeth Palace doing something that the Archbishop of Canterbury requested. And um, I was part of a group that was meeting uh, with the Russian Orthodox uh, Church in, uh, I guess that was September. I think it was September and under the uh, auspices of Metropolitan Hilarion. So, I mean, we do... Yeah, we, we get around. We just do things wherever, uh, wherever we're useful. Okay, um, I appreciate that uh, background, by the way. So, um, jumping into the Book of Acts a little bit, I think that all of us uh, uh, probably agree here that it was written by the same person who wrote Luke. Uh, our listener Jim uh, had a few questions for us, though, and he brings up the point that not everyone uh, in the scholarly world agrees with that. And so uh, can you just give us uh, your take on the authorship of Luke Acts as a set? Sure. Yeah. Uh, When we say not everyone, that's true for almost everything, but it's like almost everyone, probably 95, 99%. Now, there's the difference of opinion is on whether they... the, the more common difference of opinion is whether they share the same genre. But in terms of authorship, uh, clearly Luke presents itself, well, actually this is debated too, but Luke presents itself as a sequel, I'm sorry, Acts presents itself as a sequel to Luke. It says, you know, now concerning the, the former treatise, the former volume is how it starts out. Mm-hmm. Um, but also the, the style is very much Luke and throughout. I mean, you can see in the gospel where there are differences uh, in style because you know he's using he's using other sources that we can pick up, like Mark and uh, material that's shared with Matthew. But in terms of the the style, he he writes in kind of a more Semitic or Semiticizing style, uh, probably modeled after the Septuagint in the first couple chapters of Luke, and he does that in, in the beginning of Acts as well. Um, certain uh, phrases. Uh, there's also certain things in Luke that seem to prepare for Acts, like where, you know, the one place in, in Jesus' teachings where we have the word uh, justification, um, you know, seems to prepare for Paul's role in Acts. Uh, you have it in Luke 18, where, where I think it's functioning as 
Um, well, I think it's Luke's way of putting things. Uh, authors back then, just like authors today, are allowed to put things in their own words. Also, Luke's introduction, his, his preface to his gospel, the first person there may well prepare for the uh, first person plural material later on in Acts. So, but the style is uh, the style, the literary continuity, the parallelism between the volumes. So, um, e even right up front in in Luke chapter one, the opening narrative. You have parallelism with um, Zechariah and Mary. There, just uh, a number of a number of details. You can you can put it into a chart, and you've got like 10, 10 parallels there, and that kind of prepares the way for how um, Luke parallels characters throughout his his narratives, so that uh, Peter and Paul both parallel Jesus, and and, and so on. So um, most scholars see a narrative unity between Luke and Acts. Uh, those who don't still see a stylistic unity. Okay, and just just as an, one quick obvious follow-up, uh, I was going to put it later in the program, but I think it uh, fits better here. Is, is it uh, possible that Luke could have written Luke and then someone else, one of Luke's disciples, for instance, picked up... Um, and, and continued acts uh, in that style, uh, maybe even working off of Luke's notes. But I mean, you know, it's not unheard of that you know one person will start a series and another person will finish it. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's con that's conceivable. It's not as likely that the second author would have the same style. Um, usually, disciples they carry on the, the teaching rather than the the style so much, but uh, if yeah, but all sorts of things are conceivable. Okay, and uh, one another quick follow up. Like, again, this is from Jim. Uh, he he wanted to know your thoughts on. Okay, so so why didn't Acts originally circulate uh, along with the Gospel of Luke? Then, if if they are written by the same author, um, why didn't they circulate together? Actually, I. I think they did circulate together initially, but what we have uh, from the second century and later, you have the Gospels being piled together. So, for example, where uh, Justin Martyr in the mid-second -sec century speaks of the memoirs of the Apostles, um, probably using a language that it, you know goes back at least to Xenophon for... Uh, biographic type narratives especially about about Jesus so so the gospels uh, came to be grouped together and you know acts obviously is a follow up to that so it it was treated separately but i think when they were first written they were meant to be circulated together certainly acts chapter 1 uh, suggests that's how acts was meant to be read was with the gospel of luke Huh. So you know, this is not on our list, so forgive me for adding a follow-up that just it's occurred hard. to me. But um, so if that being the case, why don't we have more acts? I mean, we've got a f four Gospels, and it still doesn't really cover much of the story. But I mean, we've got four Gospels. We have 12 apostles. Uh, by the time Acts is written, at least, uh, well, there are 12 because one was replaced. But we only really cover the acts of two apostles. We've got the acts of Peter and Paul. I mean, it could be called that. Why don't we have more acts, if not in this book, uh, more accounts like it? I think as the focus of the early church was on Jesus, whom they regarded as the risen Lord. And so, you know, the voices of the apostles were authoritative insofar as they were witnesses to Jesus. But they weren't really interested in biography of the apostles, even even Acts itself. You know, the the title Acts of the Apostles is a later misnomer. It's not really what the, the book of Acts is about. It's, you know, the expansion of, well, I think readers in the diaspora or hearers in the diaspora uh, outside of the Holy Land, they would have understood this as, uh, outside of Judea and Galilee, they would have understood this as, you know, here's how it got from Jesus 
uh, in the initial movement to to us. Uh, here's the here's the connection to us. And the leader church did kind of use it as a uh, transition to to Paul's letters and why Paul's letters are important because they also are very early witnesses to to the movement um, and to the understanding of the movement. But it was, you know, the the interest was not primarily biography of the apostles because, like you said, there's only two of them who are really featured. And then you've got some about Stephen who wasn't one of the twelve. Some about Philip who wasn't one of the 12, different from the Philip who was one of the 12. Um, but it's mainly about Peter and the Jerusalem church on the one hand. And then you start having uh, transitions where Peter, Paul, <laughs> Peter, Paul, and then the rest of Acts follows follows the mission of Paul. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's those, those who've um, seen Acts as more biography that's why some of them want to date Acts in the 60s, because they say, well, you know, it would have narrated Paul's death if it were biography of Paul. But again, I see it more as a historical monograph than, uh, you know, followed in a biographic way, focused on these figures, but not uh, not really a, a biography per se. Thank you. That's, Thank you for the, taking the time to cover that for me. Sure. Thanks. Thanks for asking. Awesome. And yeah, and, and that sort of leads into question three about about the debate uh, on the genre of Luke and uh, versus Acts and that sort of thing. So, uh, what what do you pers- personally think is the most probable genres for both Luke and Acts, and and what are some of the reasons why why you think this? Sure. Um, the majority view, I'd say the strong majority view, is that uh, Acts is history. And since it's you know compact and it's foc- it's not a universal history, it's focused on one thing. They see see it usually as a historical monograph. The subgenre is much more debated, uh, if if we even can identify a subgenre. Um, the Gospel of Luke, however, the majority view is that it is biography. And so, since they're supposed to be read together, uh, at least most of us think they're supposed to be read together. How does that work with two different genres? Um, Probably the second leading view on Acts is that it's biography, and the second leading view on Luke's gospel is that it's history. (laughs) And I think part of the issue is that by the time you get to the early empire, there's a whole lot of overlap between biography and historiography. In fact, even before then, like the uh, Greek uh, writer Diodorus Siculus, when he's writing history, uh, he has a, a universal history, uh, so he's trying to, you know, cover cover a lot of the span of history. Uh, but he has an entire volume. I think it no, is it volume seventeen. I forget. Anyway, an entire volume is on Alexander the Great. So if you take that volume by itself, it functions as biography. But if you take it as part of the series, it functions as part of a larger history. So. That already was a possibility then, and there's, but by the time of the early empire, there's a great deal of overlap between the two. So, for example, Suetonius's Lives of the Caesars uh, actually draws on. I mean, it's very historiographic in its methodology, um, some somewhat antiquarian methodology as well. But you know, it's it's pretty much historiographic. And when Tacitus is writing his annals, the focus of the annals is somewhat more biographic because it's on the Caesars who really dominated public Roman historiography at that point. So quite a bit of overlap. Now, the other uh, proposals that have not garnered as much attention, uh, one of them is is, um, prose epic, which has, so far as I know, only a couple really strong advocates, partly because it's a genre that didn't actually exist. Um, epics were always in poetry. They were never in prose. So, I mean, it can it can function like an epic in the sense of an origin story, but it's the fact that it's in prose, that was always distinguished from Aristotle onward from the genre of epic. Um and another is the genre of novel, 
which is proposed more often for Acts than it is for um, Luke's Gospel. But, uh, of course, you can make narrative comparisons, because uh, history and novels, they, they used a lot of the same narrative techniques. The, the difference being that history had to depend on information, whereas with novels, you normally have a pretty free hand. Um, but even even uh, my friend Richard Purvo, who argued, uh, especially for comparing acts with novels, and he was he was using, I see this as anachronistic, but he was using later uh, novelistic acts from like the late second century, early third century, as parallels. Uh, even though he, he agreed that Luke's acts was earlier than that, but uh, some of the problems. Well, actually, even Richard Purvo, you know, in his later writings, he said, no, I'm not saying that Acts was a novel. I think it was history. I just think it was, you know, a lot of fictitious history, which, again, I think is it was miscategorizing genres. But um, that's that's another story about what the nature of ancient historiography was like. Uh, but novels normally were. Most often they were romances, which is a feature notoriously lacking in the Gospels and Acts. But also sometimes they were uh, about historical characters. That was that was rare, but there were some. But they were always characters of the distant past. It was never somebody recent. And never did you have the kind of uh, historical information that we have in Luke and Acts, where it's dependent, I mean, Luke dependent on Mark and in other material, and uh, the book of Acts, where you have so many correspondences with with what we can check externally from history, you, you just don't have that in novels. I mean, you can have historians who make mistakes or anachronisms, um, but novelists didn't normally do historical research to, to get things right, and we've got too many things in the book of Acts that um, correspond with external sources to to view it as a novel. Well, I, I appreciate um, the completeness of your answer, but it seems to me that there are still a few other possibilities that would help more complete the set. And so I, I want to get your opinion on those two. So uh, similar but not the same is uh, hagiography. Now, this is my own personal uh, theory. I would, I would call it hagiography, which is a, a kind of a he, hero writing, um, a, a, a little bit legend building. It's, it's something that super focuses on your protagonist in a, in a way that is not exactly historical, not exactly fiction, but maybe an exaggerated view. So I'm sure you'll have a better <laughs> definition of hagiography. Another, another, uh, I think, uh, I would consider it a genre would be euhemeritization, which would be to take um, uh, legendary things or stories and uh, read history back into them, kind of like um, Hercules. You know, you would take the myths about Hercules, but you know, later maybe you'd storytellers would. Um, make those flesh and blood stories uh, or, you know, King Arthur might, might be an example of that. Um, so that's, that's another genre possibility. Another uh, genre possibility is that it's a, it's a new genre or a different genre, just something that we're not categorizing. Uh, or it could have been the first or rare edition of one of the other genres. So you mentioned, well, you know, th this thing was rarely, if never done then, but it, started to be done at some point and so maybe that could be it could be there so I mean what what do you what do you think about especially the first two possibilities but also you know just a different a unique genre in and of itself I don't know that it has to fit into a genre um, as as neatly and cleanly as we want to make it yeah the the idea of mixing and matching genres is a is a legitimate possibility the idea of a unique genre which is sometimes proposed for the Gospels, is kind of problematic because it defeats the purpose of identifying genre to begin with. Because, you know, the purpose of identifying genre is to make analogies with the kind of options that were already on the table. Um, so, uh, but the other, the other ones in terms of 
you know, if we're going to use historical context to try to help us <clears throat> grasp what something is, we have to we have to work with existing analogies and then say where it goes beyond. But we have to have reasons for saying where it goes beyond, comparative reasons. Um, <clears throat> in terms of hagiography, you do have in the beginnings of the genre of ancient biography, in the like fourth and fifth century BCE, you have uh, things that were much more epideictic, uh, probably developing from funeral orations and so on, where you just tell the, the good side or you just tell the bad side, depending on whether you like the person or not. Uh, but then by, by this period, by the, by the early empire, and even before the early empire, by the time of Cornelius Nepos, uh, what we have of biographies they were they were much more historiographic. And in terms of historiography, even earlier than that, um, there were there were limitations in terms of, you know if you if you veered too far from this, uh, your peers would rip you to pieces. Yeah. Uh, Polybius is, of course, the, the most ripful example, if I can coin a, a neologism. Uh, he, he laid into all his competitors, but uh, some of them probably didn't deserve it quite as much as he gave it to them. But, uh, but by, by the what we call hagiography, was a genre that evolves uh, more in the third and fourth and following centuries CE. So, for example, um, well, even even Diogenes Laertius, writing probably in the early um, early third century uh, is still, I mean, he's so bound to his sources. I mean, he, he names so many of them. I mean, he's very, he's very meticulous. Uh, I don't know if we call him anal retentive or what, but he just really <laughs> is, is stuck to his sources. Uh, but afterwards you start having more hagiography, things like uh, Philostratus's life of Apollonius. But on the other hand, Philostratus, when he's writing his lives of the sophists, you know, he's he's very bound to his information. So it, it takes a while before hagiography completely takes over biography. It's not what we have in the period of the early empire. It's mm -hmm. something that develops in a in a later period of biography. And it takes I'm not even sure when it when it comes into uh, historiography. I mean, you do have I guess you do have it in historiography where it's in the sources that the historians are using. Uh, and that's where, you know, euhemerism or mythography comes in. But the, the issue with mythography is normally like, like uh, historians from the early empire, when they're talking about, um, you know, ancient times, what they would call ancient times, they would say, yeah, you know, some of these things back days of Romulus and Remus or Theseus or whatever, these are shrouded in legend. We're just giving you all the information we have. We can't verify it. But in terms of recent history, you don't normally have that. You have uh, a few stories here and there that have been done up by legend that are maybe a century from events a century earlier. But we don't have it really, certainly with, you know, a lot of events or a lot of incidents, we don't have it for works within the past, uh, the past generation, the past two generations. Uh, you start seeing it maybe a century earlier with some of early second century writings about uh, Augustus, but even there, most of it is based on historical records that they have available. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, so sort of going into question four. Um, so this is OK. So let's say Luke is ancient historiography or a historical monograph. Um, how does Luke in particular compare to other ancient historians and that sort of thing? Is he on the reliable end? Is he less reliable? Yeah. What's your take on that? And, and as you answer that, I'll just throw in my follow up right here so you can pick it, pick it all up at once. Uh, do other historians or commentators uh, cite Luke? Is he in some way peer-reviewed? I mean, you can you can talk about how people viewed other historians. Is there any way of knowing how people viewed Luke at that time? We don't we don't have enough um, 
that that's a good question. We don't have enough uh, surviving material to see how they viewed him among his contemporaries. Uh, we can see how Luke and, and Matthew viewed Mark because of how they used him, but uh, unless you date Luke earlier in the, you know, in the development of the gospel tradition, uh, we don't really have comments on Luke until we get to the second century, and those are Christian sources because the, you know, Rome was pretty much interested in what happened in Rome, and so they really didn't deal with things in the provinces except as they impacted Rome. So, for example, Pontius Pilate, even though he appears in the inscription, he appears in Josephus and Philo and in, and in the Gospels and in Acts, uh, Pontius Pilate appears only once in Roman historians, uh, well, extant Roman historians. Those were the elite historians who had enough <laughs> funding to keep, uh, you know, uh, to, to get a wide circulation. Um he appears only once, and that would be in Tacitus' Annals, 1544, where he was, his one claim to fame there is that he executed Jesus. <laughs> um, so, uh, and then, you know, Herod Antipas, who is, or Herod Agrippa, uh, who, who features very, very much in uh, Josephus, including Josephus's account of events in Rome, uh, he appears like once in, in Tacitus. He's just not, um, you know, the, the interests of different historians were normally limited to, to their sphere of uh, their audience interests. So, but going back to the question of uh, the reliable or unreliable spectrum, part of it is what we mean by reliable. And part of it, I think I, I need to preface it by explaining the nature of ancient historiography. For example, Ancient historiography, I mean, it's the precursor to modern historiography. Most of our critical methods already were there uh, by this period. I mean, Polybius laid down a bunch of them. Thucydides, even before him, was using some of those. And, uh, you know, in the, in the Roman Empire, a lot of them were using, were using uh, many of these uh, methods, although I don't think they always used them consistently. And I think often scholars today don't always use them consistently. But having said that, there are also differences between the way ancient historians and modern historians usually write. So ancient historians, they could have objectives, and they sometimes would state them up front. Sometimes right at the beginning of their work or, or partway into their work, they would say, you know, part of the, the purpose of history is to identify good deeds so we can provide good role models and bad deeds so we can identify bad role models. And because they understood that uh, history was going to be mined by orators, which was one of the main uh, main public roles back then. It would be mined for uh, examples of what to do in military situations, what to do in political situations. It would be mined for moral morals. It would be mined even for theology. So ancient historiography often uh, was was more directly... Um, well, it can have it happens with modern historiography too. Everybody comes with a perspective, but um, it would be more overtly perspectival, usually than most modern historiography would be. Also, um, well, and also it depends on what kind of history you're writing. If it's biographic history or biography, you would uh, focus more on the character of the individual even more than in normal historiography, uh, and you'd focus on that individual at length. Uh, if you were if you were doing um, wider historiography, you'd, you'd have a lot of speeches. And the historians, normally they were supposed to try to conform the speech to what they thought would have been or should have been said on the occasion, but they didn't always have very clear sources. They often had just a nucleus of what was said. And so they would develop that, and then later historians would often uh, plagiarize them, basically. But it wouldn't be called plagiarism. They'd put it in their own words, but they would, uh, you know, they'd, they'd take the speech that an earlier historian wrote, which may have not been exactly what was originally said. We have, for example, um, a speech in Tacitus, and we have an inscription for the same speech uh, of what Claudius said, 
Now, of course, the uh, inscription may be... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Claudius probably had people who edited his speech after the fact, so the inscription may include that. But Tacitus, basically, he has the same um, the, the same core substance of the speech, but the wording is completely different. So, you know, the what we would do today, we would say the person said such and such a thing, uh, and given what we know of uh, rhetorical style and their political views and so on. They probably said something like this. Ancient historians didn't do that. Ancient historians would, would, you know, they 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 were interested in the narrative uh, function of the way something was written. So they would uh, they would fill out the speech, and you were just supposed to understand that that's what they did. And some ancient writers actually would comment, you know, so you know that people did understand that that's what they were doing. But um, but we just need to keep that in mind when we read ancient historiography. In terms of where Luke stands in the continuum, because um, some people were more careless and some people were more accurate, Luke is a more popular writer than the elite historians. He's not interested in fleshing out speeches. He is interested in, in uh, keeping up the action, uh, not that he makes up the action. I mean, you read Paul's letters. Luke doesn't tell half of, of the stuff that Paul went through. Uh, but... Um, but where we can test Luke from external sources, and of course, when you're testing with external sources, you have to allow that some of those sources may have gotten it wrong. You have to allow that, obviously, you have to allow for a lot of omissions because different writers are going to focus on different things. But where we can test him, I'd say probably 80, 90 percent of the time, uh, again, we're not talking about omissions, but the vast majority of cases, Luke matches our external data. Do you consider Paul's letters part of the external sources? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Although, I mean, it wouldn't be just from that. You have plenty of other external um, data, including the timing of when uh, certain things happen in the book of Acts, uh, where certain things fit, like the Claudius's expulsion the timing of Paul's uh, appearance before Gallio, uh, Ananias is the correct priest for the the narrative date, the high priest, the uh, Felix's tenure. Felix happens to be married to Drusilla at that time, even though we know Felix had three different wives at different times. Um, Porcius Festus coming when he does. Uh, Bernice and Agrippa, uh, actually Bernice being with Agrippa at that time because uh, she was married both before and after that time, but this was a time when she was single. She was staying with her brother. So uh, it, it gets it, the kind of details that it gets right are not the kind of details you would expect a novelist to construct. You know, he's he's clearly working in the realm of information, which is what a historian would do. Now, how much adaptation a historian would make, There was there was a degree of flex room. And so... Uh, that, yeah, that's that's where we have to test it, and uh, you know we can test Luke against Mark for a lot of his material, and we can test uh, Acts against these other these other sources and against Paul's letters. Well, we'll we'll come back to that I think if we if we get a chance. But give us some practical advice here. So you've told us a great deal about uh, the way ancient history was considered uh, regarded at the time and what what their goals were how should we read it today um, should we read it the way we read a modern history as if to say these are the events that uh, are that demonstrably happened in space and time um, or, or is there maybe another more careful way to read this material? Well, historians would have more than one objective. I mean, one of their objectives was the edifying objective. And so I want to come back to that part. But in terms of events, um, historians also, the reason they wrote in the historical genre rather than a different genre was that we're supposed to be basing it on information. So uh, that doesn't always guarantee their information was correct or their sources were correct. But especially if they're writing within living memory, 
normally that would that would be the case. Um, they weren't allowed to invent events. You know, the, there was a, a degree of flex room. So from the genre itself, you can't say how much liberty they took with the events, you know, in terms of details. But you can say, if historians writing this, normally they believed that this event happened and they believe that they're correctly representing the people. Now, whether they were correct or not, like, for example, you know, they have a positive spin on a character, a negative spin on a character. Different historians had different views <laughs> in antiquity, like whether Augustus was a good guy or a bad guy and, and so on. Um, well, maybe but, it would maybe it would help if we gave an actual example. So, just to make it a little bit easier for you to explain, uh, at the beginning of Acts, uh, in chapter two, uh, Luke uh, narrates a scene where uh, the twelve come out preaching, and their heads are on fire. Mm -hmm. All right, this is this is an unlikely event. Uh, I would say, if I were reading this, I would expect this out of the National Enquirer or not the New York Times. Um, that said, do we read that as this actually happened and these guys were preaching and their heads were on fire? Or is this um, this is a story that was told and Luke is just uh, faithfully recording the story. He believes it to be true and maybe not witness it. How do, how do we look at how do we look at a story like that? Yeah, Luke does not claim to have witnessed it. And some people see it as an account of a visionary experience, although um, the idea that all of them were experiencing the same vision is, is uh, it doesn't fit what we know normally of um, psychology of hallucinations anyway. But, um, but whether it's plausible or not, if we say this isn't plausible, I think we're starting from certain presuppositions about what's likely because well, if I'm, I'm not I'm not trying to make that case. I'm okay. just trying to I'm just trying to ask, the way X is written, in, in your professional opinion, because we're asking you as an expert, should a person read everything in X, such as that story, as this is what happened? I think we believe, we can say that Luke believed that's what happened. Whether such a thing could happen depends on whether we believe that God can do things like that and would do things like that. Um, I know in my conversion, I, I left out this part, uh, partly because it freak, it could freak people out. But anyway, but in my conversion, there were, I didn't have any head on fire or anything like that. But as I'm overwhelmed with this sense of God's presence, it was, it was a couple days later that I experienced that again. Uh, and this time I, I, it started coming out, well, I was just so overwhelmed with the awesomeness of God's majesty that there was no way I could I could thank him enough or honor him enough unless he gave me the words to do it. And, you know, I'd just been a Christian for two days. I hadn't read, I mean, I think maybe I started reading the Bible. I'd gotten through maybe two chapters of Matthew or something, I don't know. But I, it started coming out in another language. And I didn't know that there was a, a name for that. I didn't know that was described in the Bible or anything like that. So that part of what happened in the day of Pentecost is not at all implausible to me. In fact, I was, I, I actually was going around thinking, well, see, I was wrong. There's a God, and therefore these Christians, they probably can look at me and they have supernatural powers and so on, which obviously turned out not to be true. But the idea of what's plausible and what's not, if if you believe that there's a supernatural God involved in certain events, then it's not plaus it's not implausible to believe that um, very dramatic and spectacular signs may have happened on those occasions. Okay. Um, so, so that's something that, you know, in terms of secular historiographic models, uh, that's something where people would agree to disagree. And in terms of the minimal... Uh, criteria we use for historiography, those are just things where we say, okay, this is what the author reports, and, you know, our presuppositions are going to vary on whether those things can happen or not. Thank okay. you for your answer. Sure. Perfect. Um, so, see, I, 
Uh, in terms of Axe's uh, main themes then, or, or emphases, and, and who the target audience is, um, would you like to give us some ideas about that? Sure. Yeah, and actually that's, uh, thanks, that actually follows up well on the previous question, because uh, I was just dealing with the one side of historiography. The, the other side is that the historian really wanted to get across certain points, that's why they chose to tell whatever story they chose, unless it was a universal history. And it's it's also why, you know, you have their perspectives on it. Uh, uh, Plutarch in the early second century actually has an essay called The Malice of Herodotus. And he just goes to town blasting Herodotus. And it turns out that the reason he thinks that Herodotus is so malicious is that Herodotus said something nasty about Boeotia, which is where Plutarch was from. But anyway, um, so again, you had different perspectives, and the perspectives were sometimes overt. Um, but in any case, in Acts, uh, you have this um, emphasis. It's it's already announced in chapter 1 and verse 8. It's actually announced at the end of, of Luke's gospel as well in, in somewhat different wording. And the emphasis is that uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit and this is like uh, the successor of Jesus' ministry in the Gospel of Luke. The uh, apostles in the church are empowered to carry on that ministry in Jesus' name and by the Holy Spirit, not by themselves, but uh, as, as, as his agents. And to bring the, bring the good news about Jesus to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and, and then what? It's kind of an asymmetric outline, if you use that as an outline, then to the uttermost parts of the earth. Uh, and now for for Luke, of course, it doesn't reach the uttermost parts of the earth. There's an open ending to Acts. But uh, it getting to Rome, the heart of the empire where Luke's audience lives, is highly significant as a major stage on the way. Because if it can get to Rome, the idea is it can get to anywhere. And you already have a, a preview of it. Uh, with the African court official in Acts chapter 8, uh, the gospel going to the south. And you have, uh, even on the day of Pentecost, with the diaspora Jews who are present for the day of Pentecost, uh, you have these these foreshadowings of, of uh, the point of Acts. So the focus of Acts seems to be on mission, empowered by the Spirit, and uh, the, the, that Acts is really emphasizing in particular against the resistance of the earliest church that was kind of ethnocentric, that God is not limited to reaching any one people or limited to one holy place like the temple, but that the, the mission is always moving outward and across barriers, Gentiles don't have to be circumcised and and um, God welcomes people from all cultures. And uh, you, you have a, a preface for that, in a sense, in, in Luke's gospel, where Jesus welcomes sinners. Uh, Jesus welcomes people who are marginalized by the moral elite. And in the book of Acts, it, it, it goes out to um, those who are the ethnically marginalized in terms of the, uh, the original elite, and, and you see sometimes the church, like in Acts chapter 11, where Peter comes back from, he's eaten with Cornelius. <laughs> and in Acts chapter 11, you have an echo of what the religious people in the Gospel of Luke were saying. You know, Jesus, you eat with sinners. That's terrible. You have, you have uh, the Jerusalem church saying, Peter, you ate with with uncircumcised Gentiles, that's terrible. <laughs> so you, you see the tension between kind of institutional, uh, institutionalized religion on the one hand and, and the spirit pushing past those barriers to, to reach out in love to all people. So when, when you say it that way, it makes it sound like a, a gospel more than a history, a, a, a sermon, a particularly religious work. I, I understand you're, you're sticking with the, the it's intended as history, but for, by the way we think of it, in just thinking about Luke's preference, 
preference, it sounds more like he was writing gospel. Well, the major theological agenda of Josephus' war and antiquities is to justify God's treatment of the Jewish people. I mean, Josephus' history is also very theological. Dio Cassius, writing Roman history, is is, uh, very much informed by a theology of, of providence. So is Dionysius of Halicarnassus. So those kind of divisions, you were were supposed to use historical data in terms of how you preached the historical data. That, again, is a matter of perspective. But uh, so I guess it depends on whether we're talking about Luke's perspective, his agendas or his data, because when you when you the reason for using this genre I mean, you can preach in all sorts of ways, but if you're using the genre of history, you're supposed to preach based on uh, or teach based on actual historical information. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, uh, David, did you want to ask question number seven? Get, well, sort so, of- yeah, the dating of Luke. Um, Luke Acts. Um, I guess there are a couple of things tied together there. First of all, uh, early date, late date, what do you have uh, it there? And you kind of answered uh, my second part of this question earlier. Do you think they were written together? Is it possible they could have been written separately? So when I was a Christian, I've been a Christian for most of my life. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, uh, obviously not a Christian now, but I always thought that Luke Acts were written separately, Um at, at later times. Furthermore, it didn't. It wouldn't have bothered me if it was much later, because you could always say, "Well, Acts was written from the notes of Luke," and even if Luke didn't write Acts, you know, one of his disciples could have picked it up, and you know, it, you know, it would have been eponymous, I, I guess, uh, 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 Luke there. But that that would have worked for me too. So, what do you think about the dating? And just as a follow up. Why why does it matter uh, for Acts, whether it was early or late? I, I, do, I do think it matters with the Gospels. I don't see that it matters as much with Acts. So tell, tell us what you uh, think is important about the dating. With, I, I agree with you that the Gospels dating is more, is more important in the sense that, well, at least for in terms of Christian faith, that's, you know, that's more central. Um, that's that's a more important issue, but the largest group of scholars date Luke between seventy and ninety, with more of them in the eighties than the seventies. Um, F. F. Bruce had originally argued for a pre-seventy date, but he shifted to a post-seventy date in his final edition. So, um, you know, the a, a lot of um, scholarship is has moved toward the middle on this. In terms of the earlier date, some have argued for the 60s. Well, actually, a lot have argued for the 60s. When uh, Richard Purvo gave his summary of the different positions, uh, obviously the 70s to the between 70 and 90, uh, the 70s and 80s was was by far the the largest position. 60s was second largest. 90s was maybe 10 percent, and then the second century was you know. A smattering of a few names, although it's increased since uh, Tyson's and and Pervo's works on that. But uh, the majority still still are in the 70s and 80s. Now, the argument for the 60s was especially well where Acts ends. But you know, it may just end there because I mean it doesn't have to end just because. That's the most recent thing that happened. I mean, we write things all the time about things in the past without bringing them up to date with, you know, or bringing them up to our time. The argument for the 70s and 80s often relates to the we material. Uh, If the author is the we narrator, then it makes sense that it's sometime uh, near then. I, I also think that there's a sec- I didn't think this when I started my commentary on Acts, but by the time I was done, 
I was firmly convinced that Acts includes a, a significant apologetic for Paul because he is like the leading figure of the Gentile mission, so uh, or the diaspora mission. Well, yeah, especially the Gentile mission. You know, not not requiring Gentiles to be circumcised. So you've got um, you've got the leading figure of your movement, the founder of your movement, who was crucified for high treason against the majesty of the emperor, as king of the Jews. Then you've got the leading figure of the Gentile mission, uh, so the kind of the sort of the father of the churches in which the you know the, the diaspora churches. You have this figure now executed by Rome, and that becomes an apologetic issue. So uh, Luke records the, a, a charge against Paul when he's arrested. Uh, what becomes the the central charge against him is that he's he's stirred up riots. So he's guilty of sedition. Acts twenty four verse five. Uh, he, they say he tried to desecrate the temple, but trying to do something wasn't actually uh, normally a, a capital charge. But sedition was. So Luke doesn't suppress the charge. It's right there, but he he gives Paul's answer to it in in his defense speeches. But there's also something else interesting. Luke doesn't suppress a history of riots surrounding Paul. He records them and then explains them differently. L Luke doesn't suppress the a narrative about riots. I mean, a historian wasn't obligated to include everything. They could leave out things they didn't want to include. But Luke records these riots and then gives an, an explanation for for why they happened. And so I think that what that suggests to me is that Luke is writing at a time where the legacy of Paul is still contested. And that's something, a, a situation similar to what we see uh, slightly in Philippians already, Philippians chapter one, but also in um, in Second Timothy, uh, you, you have that. So I think it's when Paul's legacy is being contested as somebody who started riots, and these riots were still known in certain areas like Ephesus, it was important for Luke to to give an explanation for them and not to just you know leave them out. So that tends me towards an earlier date, but you know earlier date is relative. So I mean, nobody knows the exact date. You know we we can uh, it's Paul's letters. We can often date them to within a year. You can't do that with. Acts, or, or I think with the Gospels, um, that that precisely. Now, those who date <clears throat> Acts in the 90s, it's usually because they believe that there's dependence on Josephus. But when I've gone back and looked at those cases for dependence, I don't find them persuasive at all. Uh, the one, the one thing that looks like the closest connection, he actually disagrees with Josephus on that. That's one of the major things where we have the most questions about Luke. But the other things, and even that one, I mean, if if those incidents that Josephus describes actually happened, if Josephus isn't making them up, then Josephus wouldn't have been the only person to know about them. Th these were these were public events that would have been publicly known in the first century. And so there's no reason that, that Luke would have to depend on Josephus for that. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that. I think um, we're, we're nearing the end uh, here. And this, is, this has been a delight. Um, for me too. Yeah, I feel like um, I'm going back to college and doing it right. I'm actually <laughs> listening to the professor this time. Um, <laughs> so. Thanks. Normally, this is one of the things that is disputed, although the majority of scholars think that the we was a companion of Paul. It's it's one of the more disputed issues in, in Acts scholarship. For me, just you know, working through other ancient historians, to me, it's one of the clearest issues. Mm -hmm. Because if an ancient historian said we, normally... They were including themselves in the action. I mean, historians could describe themselves in the third person. Uh, they also could describe themselves in the first person. It varied, but they wouldn't. They wouldn't include a first person reference 
if they weren't part of the action that was described. And he's not being intrusive about it. I mean, it would have been more intrusive even to, you know, mention his name. He's just he's just part of the action at that at that at those points, um, part of a, a general action. So he wants to keep the focus on Paul. He and if it were a fictitious we, we might expect it to be like at the empty tomb or the day of Pentecost, you know, those major those major events, you know, but he doesn't he doesn't intrude there. It's really at uh, kind of inconspicuous times. And, and then uh, you know it 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 starts just before Philippi in Troas. A few years later it picks up again when Paul gets to, to Philippi. So it's you know it's consistent in that way. Novels, of course, a we could be fictitious. We would expect it to be fictitious, or an I would be fictitious. But normally, a first-person claim in history would be, you know, it would be first. It it would mean that the person was there. Uh, I think uh, Sir Arthur Darby Nock. He was a leading uh, Harvard classicist of the 20th century. He he said he could think of at most one example in historical work that uh, had a fictitious we. And I don't know which example he had in mind. I can't think of any, but that's not to say that there's none in all of ancient literature. But again, the norm, if if this were not, if this hadn't been put in somebody's Bible or somebody's religious documents, if we were just reading this uh, as, you know, another uh, religiously oriented ancient historiography, because most ancient historians had some sort of religious, usually they believed in many more gods than Luke did. But uh, if, if we were reading this somewhere else, we would take it as, yeah, this is the, this is the author. Um, some people have argued, well, he's using a travel journal, which is, is entirely possible. But if he's using a travel journal, it's po- probably his own, because I mean, Luke chapter one mentions that there were many sources available. And this is the only place where we have the we. So if Luke didn't become an inept editor with this source in 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 a way that he wasn't with any other sources, I would I would it just makes more sense for this to be um, a traveling companion. Now the contrast that's often made is people say, well, this this doesn't fit a companion of Paul because you know his thinking is is different from Paul's. It is different from Paul's, but you know, nobody says that Paul wrote the book of Acts. We have comparable writings, uh, actually biographies of ancient figures from people who knew the figures, and you compare those with the letters, you have the same kinds of same kinds of differences, same range of differences. And yeah, uh, and actually one of the major differences that people used to say, uh, and some people still say, between the Paul in Acts and the Paul of the letters is that the Paul in Acts is much more Jewish. Uh, Acts 18, 18, he shaves his head for a vow. Uh, Acts 16, he, he circumcises Timothy. Um, Acts 21, he he offers sacrifice in the temple. And they say, uh, Paul, the Paul of the letters, he, he some of them even say Paul was against the law. But that is a rather tendentious reading of Paul that the new perspective on Paul has largely abandoned. And, you know, even those who don't hold the new perspective on Paul, you know, have moved away from normally saying Paul is against the law or Paul is against Judaism. And of course, you have the Paul within Judaism perspective that goes even further than uh, the the, uh, new perspective. So for those reasons, I think it's it's consistent to say, okay, this this guy is not... uh, He's not a Pauline theologian, but he he traveled with Paul. And as for who the author is, now that's more debatable. But if you look at at, uh, Paul's letters or Pauline material from the later period of his life, and and you see who was with him, who's not named in Acts already, Luke seems to be the best guess at it. Now, whether the later church guessed at it or, or not, we can't we can't be sure. But normally, they they regarded things more highly if they were by an apostle. So there were actually some of the church fathers who who really liked Matthew and John better than Mark and Luke because they said, well, they weren't apostles. And 
he he wasn't the like the most conspicuous person to to name a gospel after. Uh, Papias doesn't give us information on who wrote Luke Acts, but we do have material from the second century, uh, early second century, already citing citing Luke and I believe citing Acts. I think it actually goes back earlier than than Richard did, but uh, but at the same time. Even even with Richard, it's not going like uh, too late. He's not going as as late as as, uh, as Joseph Tyson did, because you've got the citations. But in terms of the uh, the authorship, normally classicists will start with the secondary attestation, because that that's the best lead that we have, uh, the external attestation, and they're often depending on sources a lot later than what we have for the. Uh, attributions for for Luke. So, all that being said, I think it's really strong that this is a traveling companion of Paul. I think the likeliest guess is that it's Luke, even though I wouldn't place that at the same level as this being a traveling companion. Okay, so uh, I'm going to try to tie up our last two questions as one question and just let uh, Dale do a logical follow up. Uh, for what's missed, because I, I do think they're similar, and they kind of go along with this. So if Luke was a traveling companion to Paul, uh, and this is where I think I have the biggest problems with even thinking of Luke as a history, or if a history, a very good history, there are a lot of differences between uh, Luke, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Acts and the writings of Paul. Um I, I was a fairly studious uh, Christian and uh, Bible student once upon a time, and this this was a problem for me then. Uh, you know, when I read the the Paul of of Luke of, of Acts, he almost seems like a different guy, um, quite frankly. And some of the stories narrated, I, I'll I'll leave a link in the. Um, in the blog post, I always do a blog post. So I'll, I'll leave a link or two so that uh, the readers can see what I'm talking about. I don't have time to flesh it all out here. But there are just, there are a lot of little, and I think in some cases, big discrepancies between the stories told by um, Luke and the stories told by Paul. And it's not just differences of omission. And even inside of Luke, you have, when it's, when it's dealing with Paul, you've got the story of Paul's conversion told two or three different ways with, uh, with details that um, are as different there as the gospel uh, narratives on the, the resurrection are different, except it's all within the same book and the same writer. Uh, and so can you maybe address uh, some of this? Because I know that you're making the case in part that you know, Luke is so very accurate well, I think you're going to be making the case that Luke is so very accurate. Uh, therefore, we should we should trust his reliability. But that feels a lot like counting the hits and ignoring the misses, uh, and not talking about where he doesn't seem to be very accurate or where there are very apparent contradictions. <clears throat> sure. Now, uh, what you noted about Paul's conversion. I think it's important the way you worded it in terms of the differences in detail. Those kind of differences were expected in ancient historiography. And the fact that Luke leaves those differences in there, I think, shows you the range that he expected his audience to not have problems with. So when we're talking about reliability, we're talking about the reliability of the substance and not on the level of detail. Like you, you have the same thing with Luke 24 and Acts chapter one, where Luke seems to be recounting the same scene uh, just just before the ascension. Yeah, the ascension. But, yeah. But but he doesn't. You know, the the wording is different, and so it seems to me up front, Luke just takes for granted that his audience will take for granted that this is this is the way he wrote ancient historiography, which in fact it was. I mean, you didn't have to use the same wording each time. Luke is actually much more consistent than Josephus, for example, who um, he he makes he in in one of his works he has the same speech occasion as in another of his works, 
but he makes up a different speech for it and doesn't seem to think his audience is going to mind that at all. I mean, they just take take that for granted. But so you, you mentioned the Ascension. I, I don't want to get sidetracked. That's one of my favorite um, and most puzzling things because at the end of Luke, um, Luke narrates a very detailed 24 hours and Jesus goes back. He's So it's it's one day and you open up Acts and it's 40 days. Right. It's just boom. It's wait a minute. Did you did you forget <laughs> how you ended the last uh the last book? I have never been able to really harmonize that. I've heard other people try to harmonize, it never made sense to me, but you're you're telling me that these details don't matter and that's that's kind of what what makes it all a little bit difficult for me because for me, I'm, we're talking about history, right? And if, if that's the case, and you're saying this happened, and this is how it happened, and this is what happened, it does matter. Uh, and, it, and it's troubling to me, even if it wasn't troubling to ancient audiences, when the details go all sideways, and it's this way here, and then a few pages, it's a completely different story. Well, it's troubling to us because of how we construct historiography, so we'll go back to Luke and try to figure out, okay, well, these, well, most of us actually won't, <laughs> won't try to go back behind this and figure out which details were original. We'll just say this is the way that ancient writers did it. Um, <clears throat> the, the 40 days and the, you know, the, the ending of Luke's gospel, I always use that as an example for the kind of range that Luke expected his audience to take for granted. And that, Ancient historians in general did. So, yeah, we would write historiography in a different way today, and we'd say, okay, Luke, explain this to us. But that's not what we have. But what we do have is sufficient to tell us way more than we would have. I mean, yeah, we, we have so much material that we can be confident in, in terms of incidents, in terms of uh actually a lot of the details that do go here in terms of um, the 40 days often what a writer would do they would you know they'd leave you kind of a, a summary impression at one point then you get a more detailed account that breaks it out so <clears throat> the 40 days would be what we would we would assume from that uh, telescoping events was very common you find it in Plutarch you find it in Suetonius, you find it throughout ancient historians and biographers, including from this period, which was the apex of of Roman uh, historiography and biography. Um, yeah, it. I mean, we we could give lots of examples of this in where, where they uh, in in different works, the writer will uh, leave out certain events, condense certain events, blend together certain events. And this is actually done in popular narratives today as well. Just if you're writing a history textbook, you're going to have to be more precise and give dates and so on. Uh, whereas I don't think Luke even could have given dates for, for most things. I mean, except where, say, Paul is appearing before Gallio or something like that. You don't have, um, you know, you have the memories. These things happen. But even even in an individual's memory, we usually don't remember the chronology of events. So unless we're dealing with annals, the chronology is very difficult. But uh, moving on to, to differences, um, obviously there are lots of differences, but differences are not always discrepancies. And um, most of them I would see more as, as omissions. So Colin Hemer has like over 100 pages of correspondences with external history. Some of them are stronger than others, but uh, I I made a list of, of a number of them. And when you look at, at Paul, uh, Ada von Harnack, who was considered a, a, a leading liberal scholar of the late 19th, early 20th century, um, when I say liberal, it meant different things back then than it means now, but um, that was a title he would have embraced. But Harnock thinks that Acts, apart from the miracles, because he doesn't didn't believe in miracles, but apart from the miracle accounts and things like the Ascension and so on, 
he he saw Acts as very historical because of the, the correspondences with Paul's letters. So he lists like 39 cases of these, mostly from the earlier parts of Acts. And then others have shown the, the sequence of events in Acts, uh, uh, especially uh, uh, some, someone named Thomas Campbell, but then uh, developed by Charles Talbert, who is a really... Uh, top-notch uh, historian, a uh, uh, New Testament scholar, historian, but he, they they show how the chronology, um, which is just incidental to Acts, uh, sorry, in, incidental to Paul's letters because his letters are occasional, so we have gaps where he's where we don't have any letters from him, but where he he narrates events from his past or where he is at the moment. We've just got a long list. The the itinerary of Paul's letters that, that we find in Paul's letters until we get to the pastorals, uh, the itinerary in Paul's letters actually fits what we have in Acts. And, and there's no novel that we know that that has that kind of level of correspondence. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, so I just have a couple uh, quick follow-up questions then um, before we close out here. So the first one is in relation, so we had uh, Lydia McGrew on our show um, a few weeks back, um, and she was giving her, her argument from undesigned coincidences and that sort of thing. And I was just sort of curious, what, what, what do you make of um, the recent reuse of this sort of line of apologetics in relation to Acts? Do you you find it's useful or, or yeah, like what do you make of that? I, I think it's, it's very similar to, to what we do when we look at uh, external sources. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it would be a particular kind of looking at the external sources, comparing the external sources, which is what historians do all the time, but it, it, it takes into account um, a particular category that sometimes we don't think about, and and that can be very useful. Um, I I didn't ag agree with it being deployed against certain alternative approaches, but but I did, you know, I think it's it's useful. Okay, perfect. Um, and the last follow up. So this is again from one of our listeners. Um, so they're talking about how. Uh, some scholars like Tyson or Badun have um, said that Acts was written as a early second century document designed to counter Marcion or Marcionism. Um, yeah, what what do you make of that, or how do you come back against that? I think you either have to date Marcion a lot earlier than most people do, or you have to date Acts later than when you have the first citations of it. Uh, or the first uses of Acts in second century literature. And even the first uses, I mean, very rarely is our first extant citation of a work the beginning of the actual existence of the work. I mean, because we just have chance sources from antiquity. Uh, if you, you know, usually things go back a, a bit earlier. Otherwise, you know, the, uh, the Gospel of John I think it's it's first quoted, per se, in Justin Martyr in the mid-2nd century, but we have a fragment of the Gospel of John that's probably earlier than that, uh, certainly not later than that. So uh, the first, yeah, I, I, think, I think you, I don't think it works to date Acts that late, and Richard Purvo didn't date Acts as late as Marcion either. Gotcha. Perfect. Um, okay, yeah, I think that does it for all of our questions. Um, hopefully you had a good time on your end there, Craig. Oh, it, it, was, it was fun talking with both of you. Yeah, uh, Craig, just uh, to echo, you know, as the resident skeptic here, uh, <laughs> it's been, it's been uh, delightful uh, talking to you as well. I, I can say that I had a, a similar <laughs> experience with Mike Lacona, who's also a... a a well-spoken, somewhat soft-spoken gentleman, um, and um, so there, there are a lot of us out there who don't um, accept the, the the theology, who uh -huh. still are are 
some something you might call of, of a Bible nerds, <laughs> Bible <laughs> wonks per se, because we've uh, we've spent so much of our life um, in it, and so it is it is still very nice to to get um, uh, some scholarly uh, opinion on some of these things that are that are so hotly debated. And so I appreciate you coming on the show, and I hope that you'll. I almost hate to say this. I'm almost afraid to say it. But I hope you'll stop by the comment <laughs> section sometime uh, this week because we have a lively group, um, you know. And from time to time, they they say interesting things. <laughs> and so it's it's always nice when uh, when one of the hosts uh, comes by and takes a visit and to to provoke you to emulation, Lydia. Uh, came in and got her hands dirty in the comment section. Um, <laughs> and that was a lot of fun. So uh, love to see you there. Thank, thank you so much. It's, it's great to, great to talk with you both. Perfect. And uh, right. next week, uh, no, I'm not going to ask Dale this time because I know <laughs> it's Helen Painter. We're talking biblical violence next week. Uh, oh. She has a new book out and, um, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, this is uh, this is one of my favorite topics. It's one of the favorite topics of the board. And so when I'm not nerding out about um, you know, literary types, <laughs> I like to mix it up on biblical violence. And we've got a we've got an expert coming in. So uh, be prepared for that, everyone. Um, and until then, uh, have a great week. Bye, everybody. Goodbye.